Gore, um, you've said you were born to be a writer. Do you feel this was your destiny? Well, destiny is such a grand word for a writer or for anybody, I should think. I was, I didn't elect to be a writer. I just was one. I was reading an obituary of James Merrill, the poet whom I knew for 50 years. And a friend of his said that writing poetry for him was like breathing for the rest of us. Well, writing prose was like Talking prose is for the rest of us. I began to write at the same time I began to read, and I began to read when I was, I was f prematurely forced by a blind grandfather so that I would one day read to him, which I did do. So I'd learned to read at about five, six, and as I would read a book, I would start to write a book. Can't say I got very far. But the idea that... Uh, whatever I was thinking, experiencing, observing, was more real if I wrote it down. Where that came from, I haven't a clue. When you learned to read, did you, do you remember learning, do you remember a sense of, right, a great sense of power from being able to read? At first, it was as agonizing for me as it is for any four-year-old. A is for apple, and the teacher would say, and they'd put an apple in front of you, and B is for a bear, and they'd put a bear, and so on. But I learned quickly because, partly being forced by the blind grandfather, but uh, I wanted to get inside those books. I wanted to know those stories. I, I had to take Latin for eight years. It always seemed to be Caesar's very boring wars in Gaul. But I got so interested in Caesar that I got a trot, which you weren't supposed to do, which was the English translation of the Latin. And I had to find out how the story ended. So I got caught with a trot. And I said, well, I just, I, I'm so bored doing a paragraph a day. I want to see how it turns out. So it was in order to read books for myself and not be read to. I found grown-ups not terribly reliable when it came to reading to you. So the sooner I could do it for myself, I did it for myself, and uh, simultaneously started to write. And here I am. Was it your grandmother or your grandfather that taught you to read? Well, bl blind men are not all that good at uh, deciphering the text, so my grandmother was called in, but as she had been reading to him for half a century, Anyone who could spell her was a hero in her eyes, and I was the only one of the descendants who liked to read and had any aptitude for it. So her heart was really in it as she led me through prose. And just I was forced to guess at meanings, and I wasn't given much help. I quickly learned about syllables, and I learned how to string them together. And anything difficult, uh, sometimes they would tell me, but they wanted me to find it out for myself. I was sufficiently curious to do so, much of the time. What are the first books you remember reading? Well, the first book I read all on my own was a kid's book. By and large, I didn't like children's books. The first book I really liked was Tales from Livy, the Roman historian or mythographer, depending on how you read him. I thought those were wonderful. They had wonderful 19th century colored illustrations. And that was my world. I was very much at home in the Roman world. That was the first book I had a passion for, and a grown-up passion, even though I was seven, eight. Or... But at about five or six, I read something called The Duck and the Kangaroo, a story of unnatural love between a duck and a kangaroo. And uh, I wasn't bowled over by it, but I was rather pleased that I had read it all to myself and didn't have to call in my grandmother to help out. And from then on, a door opened, and there was literature. And there was I. 
Mind you, I wanted to be a politician. I had no desire to be a writer. But since I was already a passionate reader and was writing, eventually the two became one. And you cannot be both a politician and a writer, since, as I have said so often, uh, a writer must always tell the truth to the extent he understands it. And a politician must never give the game away. That's why, except for Benjamin Disraeli, there's ne never been a good writer-politician. And don't write in about Winston Churchill. He was a terrible writer. So you, did you spend a lot of your childhood reading? As much as I could, yes. There were powerful forces at work to get me. I was the son of an all-American football player. No, my father liked the fact that I was a reader-writer. He was fascinated by it, because he wasn't. And in every way that I differed from his highly successful career as an athlete and in aviation, uh, he was very pleased. So there was no... might have been better if he hadn't been. Then I would have forced myself harder to overcome parental disapproval. But I had parental approval in spades there. And he was rather delighted that I should be, he used the word erudite, and it was the first time I'd heard that word used, and I went and looked it up, and uh, surprised that he had used it. So it was, um, go on. Um, we'll come back to talk yeah. about reading to your grandfather and so on, but... Um, do you still love to read? Do you still read a lot of these? Yeah, I do. It's, it's more difficult with age. My eyes are not what they were. And uh, until two or three years ago, I could read the smallest print without glasses. Now I have a difficult time with glasses. And that is an annoyance beyond belief to somebody used to reading in the half-dark and on airplanes and uh, with no light at all, practically, and the smallest type. No, I'm constantly at it. I have changed. I don't, like most people as they get older, I no longer care so much for invented stories as I do for the memoir, the biography, letters, something that has the unexpectedness of life, most fiction writers, I find, are rather to be anticipated in their effects, and they're not half as uh, droll as real-life people. I just came across a wonderful line of Benjamin Disraeli. He got sent books as prime minister and also as a very popular novelist. Would-be authors would send him their books, and he had a standard reply. Thank you, sir, for sending me your new book, Never fear, I shall waste no time in reading it. Not what they hoped for. <laughs> I think as they read it, it was exactly what they hoped for. Um, what book, if any, do you keep by your bedside? Well, for years I kept uh, Frames, a uh, translation of Montaigne, which has now been replaced by Screech, though I don't read him as much as I used to, as I've read so much of Montaigne over the years, that the best of it I sort of know by heart. Uh, he's useful for leading me back into the classics. I have classic jags every now and then. I'm reading Lucian. Uh, I'll pick somebody that I have never got around to. Lucretius I did a few years ago, just went through from beginning to end, at least in the Lo Loeb Library. Uh, he's very good as a guide, let's say, to Cicero. If you read enough Montaigne, he, he's a road map of where to go when you read Cicero. Otherwise, you've got 30 volumes to wrestle with. Uh, otherwise, there are no bedside books other than the ones that I am reading, and I usually read two or three at the same time. Um, can you tell me who your, what your favorite book I don't think writers have favorite books. And certainly after a certain amount of time, 
and life and experience and just simply mileage, uh, you've had your favorites. And I shudder when I think, when I was 20, how much I admired D.H. Lawrence, whom I came to loathe. The more I understood him, all that the fascism of Aaron's rod and kangaroo really, really got on my nerves. Whereas first time around, I just saw the kind of wild, would-be sensuality of the books. You go through phases. Who, who would you say are your literary ancestors? What, what writers have most influenced you? What I would put my, my roots in the classical past I suppose to begin with, in my grandfather's library, there, he had the classics. And uh, as I said, stories from Livy was my introduction to the Roman world. And I just kept on between Rome and Greece. I'd say as a novelist, if I were to analyze the, my inventions, as I call them, books like Myra Breckenridge or Duluth, I would find my ancestry in Petronius and in Latin and Apuleius, the golden ass in Greek. And I think of them as the two progenitors, and they gave me the courage of example. That in the days when we were all so nervous about obscenity and pornography and this and that, you know, the United States has come very, very late to the edge of civilization. We haven't crossed into a civilization of any kind, and I'm not terribly optimistic, but Rome and Greece both did, each in its own way. And through reading particularly those two writers who were essentially satirists and juvenile and martial, uh, I found my voice through them. I'd like to be able to boast and say that I read them one in Greek and the other in Latin, but I didn't. I read them in translation. But that was quite enough to jet propel me. And what about Henry James and some of the other... James uh, was a great influence, but uh, that's later. It's what gets you going early. Then you go through phases of liking people, not liking them. Uh, I put off until I was 40, Milton, because I'd hated him so much in school. And then at 40, in this very room, I would, uh, when I first woke up, drinking coffee, I would read a section of uh, Paradise Lost aloud every morning. You must read it aloud and get the sound of it. And once you do that, um, it is a revelation. It is, to me, greater than Shakespeare. It is uh, well, overpowering. And I wrote about it in Palimpsest, a memoir that I wrote a few years ago, and uh, one of the reviewers of the book was Martin Amos, who's quite a good writer, English novelist, and well, we were on television not long ago together, and he said, he was talking about turning 40, and he said, I followed your advice. I read Paradise Lost. I said, did it work? He said, yes, it works. What about other influences um, in, in your... Well, you have... You have uh, Affections. I think it's a bit like sex or, or friendship. Uh, you have an affinity, an elective affinity for a writer, and then sometimes you lose it, sometimes you just absorb it, and you don't think about it again. I had a long period with James. I came to him pretty late. I waited wisely with George Eliot until I was well into my 40s on the ground that I advised no teacher ever to give Eliot to anyone uh, in school. They're too young for it. You have to know about time, and you have to know about death, and you have to know about the disappointments of the day. 
before you can deal with George Eliot. So I waited until I was in my 30s, and I read all of George Eliot and ended up regarding her as probably the greatest novelist in English of that division, which is, uh, who was it? Uh, Mario Prats, who must always make the sign, the jettatura against the evil eye, because he's supposed to have had it, but he was the best, probably the greatest critic of English romantic literature and of what he called Biedermeyer, which was the middle-class novel of the 19th century. And she was the great master of that, that she wrote about marriage, divorce. She wrote the first great study of alcoholism. Janet something, or was the title of it. It was a woman alcoholic. This was a very daring thing to do in that period when ladies didn't know about such things. And here is Eliot writing a tougher novel than The Lost Weekend of Charles Jackson to mention a novel of yesteryear. And she she was in a territory that I don't much care for, but she certainly brings it to life. And uh, I was profoundly impressed, though not in the least uh, uh, influenced. Who is your ideal reader? Well, I prefer them not to move their lips, but if that's the only way they can get it, move your lips. And it might even be better if you read me aloud, because I write for the ear as well as the eye. And um, which is why a number of my books have been done by these people reading them, audio uh, editions, whatever it is they call them, and... uh, and an actress who's a great friend of mine has read several of mine, including The Golden Age. And I've never had the nerve to listen for fear I wouldn't like what I heard, meaning that I wouldn't like what I was doing, what I was writing, because she's a very good actress. But one day I really will sit down and listen, particularly when a good performer is doing them. And as you know, in antiquity, uh, all reading was done aloud. If you were in a classroom, you would hear 50 boys or girls, if it was a girl's classroom, uh, there was nothing but noise as they read. They all read aloud. I don't know what the teacher made of it, how how he could make anything of it, but you read aloud. And it was often, it would be noticed when I was writing about the Emperor Julian, the fourth century apostate emperor, Someone wrote in a letter that he was, even in his school days, he was famous for reading silently, which some people took as a, he wasn't, couldn't be very serious if he read silently. How do we know he got it? You know, you have to hear it. Well, that's an interesting attitude toward reading. Well, that would be very unusual at that time, wouldn't it? It was. That's why somebody thought to mention it in a letter to a friend, you know, he he did. He read to himself. He read quietly, well, but he read an awful was, lot. I think I read that that it started out as a form of, that it was prayers. So reading them aloud was. It might have started with uh, with prayers. Also, I would say before reading began, or, or prose, uh, it was music. It was singing. So instead of, you would all sing together, and that would be either a prayer or whatever it was you had in mind. So essentially we go back to sound and what are words on a page, but uh, like notes of music for a musician, they're there to strike something in your brain to make a picture. I used to have more than I do now. I had the gift of, uh, oh, the curse of being able to visualize what I read on the page. It's what is called an eidetic memory or an eidetic form of reading. And I asked a class this. I was up at Dartmouth, and I took the classics class. They came to different classes would come and visit you as part of the thing. And the classics wanted to come see me, and I wanted to see them. And I pulled this. I said, how many of you 
visualize actually what you're reading. Well, they didn't know what I was talking about, except for one girl. And she said, do you do that? And I said, well, I used to. And I said, sometimes I can do it. I, I can't force it. It'll just happen. I'll be reading about, I don't know, Versailles and Louis XIV crosses in front of the uh, muse, and suddenly I'll, I'll see it and smell it and feel it in the air. And she was quite wonderful. She went into, she said, well, I get that reading Homer. And she said, actually, I have seen the Greek encampment at Troy, black wool tents on a beach, on a brown beach. And I said, you ever checked to see whether the beach was brown? And she said, yes, it was brown. And that uh, is one of the miracles of reading, if you have the trick of the eidetic memory, which I don't think you can learn. Either you have it or you don't. I don't have it much anymore because I think, like many youthful things, it wears out on you. But I have had it. I always thought it came from uh, in my, you know, from seeing movies. I mean, they're, I'm picturing um, what you're reading. Well, that's remembering the movie. No. no it's. It is from the page itself. I, no, it first hit me in a bathtub at Marywood in Virginia, above the Potomac River, the house of my stepfather, Mr. Auchincloss. And I was about 13, 14, and I was in a hot tub reading one of the Tarzan books. And suddenly, in the middle of it, and I remember for some reason I was using a kind of very harsh ivory soap. I still remember the smell of that soap. And I was in the jungle, a jungle which mysteriously smelled of ivory soap, which rather spoiled the effect, but I couldn't control that. And my heavens, there I was, and there was... Numa, the lion, and Tantor, the elephant, and Tarzan swinging through the trees. And I thought, this is wild. And uh, it stayed with me for quite a bit. Well, quite a bit, ten minutes maybe. And then I would have recurrences, not of that scene, but of other scenes that I was reading. Uh, I don't know how it works when you sit down to write something, to make up something out of your head. Uh, sometimes at great speed, something like Meyer Breckenridge, which I, I wrote in some maybe four weeks, uh, I, I know that I visualize an awful lot of it, and I heard a lot of it. I hear more than I see. And uh, dialogue, I, I hear it even as I write it was a great help when I turned dramatist. And do you ever, um, when you finish, finish a passage or, or a scene or a chapter, read it aloud at the end when you're working? Yeah. Can you explain that? Well, I, t uh, I take, um, I don't read everything I write aloud, but I read a good deal. I, I read key passages, and I always read the dialogue to make sure it rings true. And I am a mimic, and I, can, I have a fairly wide repertory, or, or used to have, of different accents. So I would, um, particularly if I'm writing a play, uh, I, I do read the dialogue aloud. Prose is a little different. It depends on what kind of prose you're doing. If I'm doing invented stuff, uh, I tend to read it because I write it as if it were poetry. I parse it, and it's it's got it, it's got it's got its own innate rhythm, and I have to make sure I'm, I'm maintaining the rhythm and I'm not breaking it. Uh, if I'm writing history or criticism, I don't read aloud. Where do your ideas for books come from? Out of the blue. 
I was walking down, I often mix it up, but I was walking down the steps from the Quirinale Palace toward the Corso in Rome, and suddenly into my head came America uh, Duluth, love it or loathe it, you can never leave it or lose it. What on earth, I said to myself, does that mean? And why Duluth, one of the few American cities I've never set foot in? But it, I went home, wrote it down, and a book just followed. Wrote itself, as they say. And I realized that I had had one of those lucky uh, moments in which something comes to you and says, all right, here I am, write me, write it down, it's coming. Don't do anything to it, just leave it alone, let it come out. Does that happen a lot? When no, it does not happen a lot. <laughs> but, but when you're writing a novel, yeah. and do you sometimes feel like the story is leading you? I think if you're going to stay interested in the writing of a novel or anything invented... If the story doesn't lead you, abandon it. I mean, what's the point of writing something that you know already what it's going to be? I never know where I'm going, and this is even truer when I turn to my historical novels, where I am obviously circumscribed by the fact that John Wilkes Booth is going to shoot Abraham Lincoln, but I have to stay with certain facts that will govern my narrative, but at the same time... I get extraordinary insights into people that I never thought I would have. Uh, I've never liked Woodrow Wilson. This is a family dislike because of my grandfather's problems with him, and I took my grandfather's side. And I still don't much care for Wilson as president or in any other way. And yet when I came to write Hollywood, which, as I pointed out to somebody, is about Woodrow Wilson and Warren Harding and not so much about Hollywood, uh, Wilson comes out of it very well because you have to become Wilson while you write him and you see why he does certain things or you think you see why he does certain things and he imposes, the character imposes a kind of logic which impels you to, to be him and to argue his case now, if I just didn't like Woodrow Wilson, sat down and wrote a book to show what an awful man Woodrow Wilson was, why bother? I could do that in a paragraph somewhere. Why write a book about it? So it's constant discovery. You, you don't know really what you think, even of a historical character that you may have thought quite a bit about. Uh, then when what's invented, that's the joy of what I call the inventions, and I've done a dozen or so now, is you never know. I was halfway through Myra Breckenridge before I realized that she had been a man. I had no idea that this was a transsexualist, except the dialogue kept going wrong for a woman. And I kept thinking, well, Myra has her own voice, and I heard her voice walking along a Roman street. Uh, I am Myra Breckenridge, whom no man will possess, started to thunder in my head, this great raging voice. So I just followed my voice where it led me. Well, halfway through, I realized she'd been a man. And that was the plot. As it turned out, it was a lot of plot. Well, if you start out knowing things like this, it's like painting by the numbers, which I think must be the most boring thing on earth. If you can't surprise yourself, how are you going to surprise anyone else? I, I read um, that you said... Sometimes when you're writing, you laugh out loud. I wondered what would give me an example of what would give you such pleasure. Or well, obviously, a funny line would make me laugh out loud. And a funny line that I had not anticipated. Language dictates what it's going to do as it comes out of you. And it starts to manipulate itself. You manipulate it, but it manipulates you simultaneously. 
and suddenly you get a wonderfully comic effect that you didn't intend, and there it is, and you laugh. I used to work in the same room in the days when Tennessee Williams and I traveled around Italy, and we would share, we got these great suites in those days for practically nothing, and we would share a living room. And I'd be writing longhand at one end, and he'd be writing on the typewriter at the other. And Tennessee was just, he would go type, 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 and he's very fast typist. And then he'd go, <gasps> and suddenly Blanche Dubois had joined us in the room, and Tennessee was suffering with his heroines. And uh, he, he would really be limp when he finished a scene. Would you ever read out loud for each other no. what you were working on? Never give each other the satisfaction. Oh, I'm not, when, you, when you're working on a, one of the historical novels and you have an invented, a purely an invented character, and then you have a character like you were describing Wilson, but it could be Roosevelt or whoever mm-hmm. that's, or Lincoln, um, but that's not such a good example you know, where you have side-by-side side and interacting an invented character and a character from history, but but that, does the character from history become as much yours as an invented character? No, he's, whatever it is that I will have him say to the invented character, he indeed said to somebody in pretty similar form to what I am about to transcribe. The fact that I don't sometimes give it to the actual person he said or wrote it to, means that I want to analyze what he said and did, which obviously the recipient of his conversation or letter uh, never did. So my invented character can hear something very interesting from Franklin Roosevelt about uh, Wendell Wilkie and the proposed plot to overthrow the election of uh, 1940, which was being rumored all over the country that the Germans were going to pay people to overthrow the election. (laughs) We have the Supreme Court now. They had Germans then. And uh, I can have Roosevelt say something along these lines, which I know that he had said to Eleanor Roosevelt or to Harry Hopkins and say it to Caroline, an invented character, and she can inquire into it more and get a bigger sense of what it was all about than the actual historical recipient of uh, President Roosevelt's warning and worry. I guess I meant um, in terms of your... You didn't invent him, but you're the way you've written about him when he and Caroline are talking, I mean there's no there isn't that in terms of when you're writing the Henry Adams character versus, you know, Caroline or some mm-hmm. one of your invented characters, is your involvement any different? Is, your, is it any different? Is the well, Henry Adams is closer to me in attitude and tone of voice, or I am closer to him. And obviously, I'm more at home with him. And I'm, but he's written so much about himself. I mean, you can you can fill an entire novel, a very long book, with nothing but conversations of Henry Adams to different people, as indeed uh, others have done dealing with Adams. We, we know all of his favorite lines and what line he would take on almost anything. And he is sort of the Greek chorus of the Republic as it was turning into an empire in 1898 and then just before he died. I think he died in 1917 when we were really stepping out of the world stage and the European War. No, I don't feel any different. I just feel more at home, probably. Do 
getting back to something you alluded to earlier, um, um, do you consider yourself or like an observer, as a person? Do you think this is is related to becoming a writer? Did you, did you ever discover at a certain point in your younger life that you were observing as well as participating in life? Well, I think everybody has those sense. If you're not the principal character in a scene that's going on around you, which in the case of most people would be their families, when they themselves are not the center of attention but the mother or the father or a sibling is, uh, yes, you do. You do a lot of behavioral observing, observation. But did I ever sit down and take notes on what people say and do? No, no. On the other hand, I have a very good audio memory. I can re recall conversations from years ago. And uh, would ask me what someone was wearing, or what they looked like, and that has already started to blur. There are those who hear the text, and there are those uh, who see the scene. That's why I was so grateful in the days when I had my eidetic memory or capacity when reading, that I could really summon up things visually. It was stunning to me, because that isn't the way my brain normally works. I was getting a little something extra that fate had not dealt me, except as a tantalizing glimpse. You said, I guess, uh, that writing makes an experience seem more real to you. No, the writing itself is probably more real than the experience. It's a commonplace that many writers uh, don't feel anything until they've written it. And that's why there's so much bad writing, and that's why some good writing is very good indeed not able to have lived it within the scene as it played out in your life, you can revise and review it. Tennessee was the greatest example of that. He would, he would fall in love, we'll say, with an unobtainable object, write a play in which the unobtainable is obtained, not necessarily by his character, but by a character. By possessing then the beloved in his text, he would have totally drawn that character toward him, and he would be the sole inventor, progenitor of that character. Then he gets another go at it. He goes into rehearsals. Uh, there is an actor and an actress playing this couple that he was in love with or drawn to or aroused by. And then from rehearsal, it goes into performance. He has three goes at everything. He was a happy man, despite his demons. Why do you write? It is my nature to write. Also, it is my nature to think, or to try to think, or to think that I am thinking. This is best done by writing. Let's say I'm going to review a book. I've just read the book because I'm going to review it. I start out with no particular prejudice. If it's by a writer whom I dislike, I won't review it. But it's about a writer that I'll be blank about, and I read it, and I make up my mind as I go along. I make notes. When I finish the book, I still don't often know what I think about it. I go through, I make the notes in the margin, I go through and I add them up. As I add them up, then I think, well, I guess this is what I think about it. But really, am I being fair? Am I, have I thought enough about it? Then I take the next step, which is what we call literary criticism, something very few people, particularly in America, know how to practice. It's description. I then describe the book that I have read, helped out by my marginal notes, which comment upon details that I would probably have forgotten in the course of reading. 
So those act as markers for me. And then I have the text. And I I start to describe it. I don't even know how I'm going to begin. Once I begin, I find that as I describe the book, my description of the book, I never say I like it or dislike it. Only hacks do that. Nobody cares. Let me tell you, any of you who happen to think you're book reviewers, don't give your opinion. Only your mother cares about that. What the real reader wants is a description of what you have read. And you don't have to say it's good or bad. The words that you use to describe the book that you read will be the criticism. Whether you like it or not, you've done it. It's true. When I read your um, Twelve Caesars, Mm -hmm. I immediately wanted to run out and... Get given? Yeah. You know, it, it... by your description, made me want to pursue it more. That was a funny piece, my thing on the Twelve Caesars. I wrote that for nobody. There had been a new translation of uh, Suetonius mm-hmm. about the Twelve Caesars. And I, f- I found a new idea reading it. Gibbon had said of the first Twelve Caesars, twelve very tough military men, only one of them was sexually regular meaning in today's terms, heterosexual. And that was Claudius. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. He's odd man out. (laughs) The others were bisexual like everybody else, like everyone was intended to be. How on earth did we get into this situation where the, the odd Caesar is considered the normal one And the 11 others are deranged monsters. Some of them were deranged monsters, but the others were very capable people. Haven't we got it backwards? And I sat down and wrote this piece, and nobody would publish it. They said, it's untrue. I said, well, because your superstitions about sex you take to be true doesn't mean that I take them to be true. And the 12 Caesars, these 12 rather tough military men, would be rather horrified that you would look down on them because on Monday it was a boy and on Tuesday it was a girl. Uh, Who are we to make these rules? Or why not follow evidence? Evidence. This is something that's not in the American uh, tradition. Evidence is something that faith can overcome. What year was that? 1950. And finally the nation published it. And there began, and I've been writing for the nation for over 50 years now. And it all began with the 12 Caesars. And yet Kinsey, the Kinsey Report has come out yeah. in the 40s. Oh, but the attacks on it, I must say, every well-thinking liberal particularly, forget the conservatives, but Lionel Trilling launched a major attack. Where's love, said Lionel Trilling and all this? Well, he wasn't interested in love, he was interested in ejaculation. You can't measure one person's love for another, but you can certainly measure the number of ejaculations he's had with George or Anne or the family pets. Can you say that, could you somehow bring in the Kinsey Report? Of course, when I wrote The Twelve Caesars, the Kinsey Report had been out for two years as had The City and the Pillar by me, which came out just before this Kinsey report. So I had submitted some evidence that uh, people are much more various in their sexual responses than uh, the society, particularly American society, corrupted by monotheism, uh, would allow. So everybody had been alerted, but just people could, couldn't face what I had to say about the Twelve Caesars, much less what I had said in The City and the Pillar. And poor Kinsey. Great liberals like Lionel Trilling were denouncing him as, uh, where is love? Where is love? Well, he said, I'm a scientist. I can't gauge people's love. I'm trying to figure out who does what with whom and how often. I'm measuring. I'm not uh, divining well, this is, a, this is beyond the American ability to absorb anything so complex 
as evidence. See, evidence is the one thing that faith can always bury. For whom do you write? For whom do I write? Well, that's a difficult one. Virginia Woolf's common reader, I think, was my common reader. The person who was curious to find out things that he or she didn't know and would come to a book to read about, whether it was other states of being or activities in classes, nationalities, religions, not one's own. You read for information, you read for to inhabit alternative worlds. And some of the ones I've created have been really quite off the wall, intentionally. Um, I've had many different audiences. I mean, people who like uh, Duluth or Myra Breckenridge are not apt to be terribly keen on Burr or Lincoln, and vice versa. Uh, my publishers were always distressed that I wanted to do the two lines of books. They wanted me to do correct historical novels and leave my inventions alone. But the inventions were the favorite books of people like Italo Calvino, probably the greatest 20th century writer. So uh, if, if he alone was my only reader, I would have been quite content. You just have, you have different readers of different sorts, and you don't necessarily write for them. Tennessee was a very dear friend of mine, and he was bored to death by novels by anybody. He always praised people like Carson McCullers, you know, who, who needed help. But uh, you know, Tennessee couldn't get through a novel. He was only he interested, interested in poetry, and he was interested in, uh, obviously, in the theater. But novels did nothing for him. They, they just, they were pretty dead. So, in other words, I was not writing for my friend Tennessee Williams. On the other hand, he was writing for me. I, I loved some of those plays. And, but in the long run, I found that it was not his plays that I cared about. It was his short stories. He really was our best short story writer. And you can't tell. I did, didn't figure it out until I wrote the preface to some 50 of his short stories, and I read them all straight through. And that's when I came to the conclusion that the novel isn't for Americans. They don't write them terribly well. Obviously, they're great exceptions, but by and large, it's a short story writing country, and it's a poetry writing country. We have many good poets, and we have wonderful short story writers. I'd much rather read a short story by Melville than read uh, Moby Dick. No, no power could get me to read that again. But on the other hand, I think Redburn is pretty wonderful. Um, let's talk a little about um, some of the process or the rituals. Um, at what time of day do you write? Well, I write when I get up, and that can be any time of day. And uh, I like to start in right away. As soon as I have risen from bed, I go to my desk, and you are closer to your dream life at early in the morning. In fact, I dream intensely, and I still have, I often remember them. Not that I sit down and record dreams, but the world of the dream is still with me when I start to write. Another trick I've found that I pass on to anyone who's interested, if at a certain age, such as the one that I have achieved, your memory starts to go, and we all have the experience, oh, what's his name? Oh, you know him. He was married to that actress. No, no, not that one. The one with the red hair. No, you, come on, what was the name? We all get into that bind. We can't think of the names. Trick. As you go to bed at night, try and think of the man who married the red-headed actress. First thing when you wake up in the morning, you'll have the name. 
my whoever is in charge of my files just gets busy during the night, exhausted sometimes when I've had a day of not getting names wrong, and it'll all be laid out. And it's it's wonderful. And the same thing happens. Um, Calvino said it would, it would happen to him was upon waking, things that had been difficult for him when he had ceased to work the day before would suddenly straighten out. Graham Greene said the same thing, though he was not very inventive as a writer, but um, he had a clear narrative sense and I suppose came up against roadblocks. It is the early hours of the morning or the early hours upon awakening that the answers come. Do you, um, do you write uh, longhand or use a typewriter or computer? I have a large corn here on my middle finger of my right hand, which is from writing longhand. I write the novels in longhand and uh, dialogue, if I'm writing a play, on the typewriter, portable typewriter. I never graduated to the electrical ones. And uh, essay writing I tend to do on the typewriter because you're making, a, it's like a legal brief, you're making an argument and you have to see, you have to see what you've written. The other unpleasant side of uh, another unpleasant side of age is short-term memory starts to go. And I haven't got to the point where I come to the end of the page and cannot remember how it started. But I can certainly, if I'm writing a long piece, have to refer back to the points I made early on in order to pull it together at the end. In the old days, I could uh, hold it all in my head. I could hold a whole book, just like a, as a conductor does a score. Lenny Bernstein could, was walking around with all of Mahler in his head, you know, and he could just reproduce it whenever he, he chose. Had he lived longer, he would have begun to lose that. He might have begun to lose it toward the end anyway. Um, so does writing come easily to you? Yes. Rewriting does not come easily to me, and I rewrite a great deal. I seem to do five versions of everything. And uh, sometimes I cheat or sometimes I think, well, my third or fourth version, I've got it. Never write and I reread it. Oh, it's got to go through the next and the next. The fifth generally is it. If I have to go on past that, then I've done something probably very wrong when I began the piece. And so I'll scrap it or do something else. So when your book goes to the publisher, uh, I mean to the editor, do you have an editor that you work with or do you pretty much edit yourself? Oh, I edit myself. Uh, I like another pair of eyes, but um, that's just I before E except after C, you know, kind of stuff. Copy editing is what they used. I used to rely on. We all did. And except for certain places now, in the magazine world, uh, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker have good uh, good copy editors. But most of them don't have any at all, and you see the results on the page. But uh, no, I've never relied on editorial help. I did have one editor who didn't contribute much of anything, except one thing that was invaluable. He knew a lot of historians. And until very recently, every one of those historical things of mine from Burr, Lincoln, 1876, was each given to an expert in the field, a professor of the level of David Herbert Donald in the case of Lincoln, McKittrick in the case of 1876, authorities on the period who would read the novel, uh, be given a polite fee for doing it, and point out any ghastly mistakes that I might have made. And generally they didn't find any ghastly mistakes, but where they were terribly useful was to draw my attention to later literature on the subject that I hadn't seen, but they, as professors, 
we're obliged to look at and say, well, the attitudes on dueling, we know much more about Hamilton and Burr than you knew when you wrote it at the time or when your authorities wrote about it. That was very useful. Um, You've already talked about this a bit. Um, I was going to ask, you know, whether you plot the arc of the book, but you talked about, you know, it being an act of discovery. Can you talk about sentences? You once said you, you write sentence by sentence. Well, I write as if I were writing a poem, generally. Uh, even dialogue has its own kind of rhythm to it and contrapuntal since you, I try to make my characters each sound different from the other. Um, what did you say? I'm sorry. I was asking about writing sentence by sentence. If one's going very fast with something like uh, Myra, then you have to say it's a mystical experience. You don't know what's going It's like automatic writing. You don't know what's going to come out. That really is startling. And it's not till you reread that you think, oh, my God, is that what I was doing? Uh, if you're doing something like Julian, where you know you have, you have history to draw upon, you have his correspondence, then it really is, you know, you're... You're working with a mallet and a chisel, and you're you're working in marble. And uh, try not to make mistakes because you may wreck it. That's sentence by sentence, and I think it was apropos of that that I made that remark. Um, you you mentioned this already, but I wanted to ask you about research. How do you go about researching? Whether you do it all yourself? I do my own research. I would certainly farm it out if I knew what I wanted. But it's not until you start researching do you realize what it is that you do want and uh, and what is out there. I, I pity the people in the new era of uh, libraries where you press buttons and so on and you you can't walk through the stacks. Walking through the stacks and taking books down and, and looking quickly through them, I can find immediately what I need. And uh, I can't tell a librarian in advance just from a list of titles. I don't know which one I'm going to want. So I do that myself, usually going through the stacks of some library in the States or if it's classical at the American Library or if it's classical at the library of the American Academy, out of which came two books, Julian and Creation, I have to um, collect books, really, when I'm starting on a subject. I was lucky with Burr. There was a, in Los Angeles, where I was living at the time, there was a collector of books about Burr. And it went on the market, and nobody was interested in Burr in all of Los Angeles except me, so I bought this about 400 volumes for very little. And so I do my own research, partly because it's the most fun. The writing can be laborious with that sort of book, because you have to juggle so many facts, and you have to fit them in. It's like, like doing a mosaic. Whereas the research, just looking for a little bright glittering bits of porphyry and uh, gold leaf to put together in, in a pattern. Uh, that's that's, that, that's the, the treasure along the way. But I've never had a, a researcher. I get into controversies in which I have a couple of people I call up who will go to the library and look up stuff that I'm not in a situation to do. Sitting here in Italy, I can't very well get to the Library of Congress to buttress my case. How would you define your writing style? You seem to have so many voices. Well, I don't know how I would define my writing style since uh, I write in different voices. 
Um, I think it varies from book to book, depending on the subject, depending on what character, whose point of view I, I'm telling the story from. In Julian, I have um, four voices. I have the emperor as emperor, trying to sound like Marcus Aurelius and making a hash out of it. Then I have the emperor as an extremely nervous military commander who's about to be murdered by his own troops, and his style totally changes. Then I have uh, Libanias, as some pronounce him. And uh, he's rather sardonic. Maximus is sort of a inflated, pompous fool. And all, each voice plays off the other voice. And uh, since it's largely letters, uh, you have the legitimacy of the form to have this, to use that awful word again, contrapuntal effect. With a Myra or Myron or something like perhaps Kalki, which is told in the voice of a woman, who survives the end of the world. Uh, it's a challenge to inhabit somebody quite different from yourself. And that's the fun of that. And that's... Your only worry there is uh, getting a little bit too inventive, more than the case requires. Most people do not aim at colorful speech. If they have colorful speech, it's part of their DNA code, or nature versus nurture, or nurture versus nature. They aren't doing it consciously. They, an author who is becoming somebody else is working consciously, and hence the possibility of striking wrong notes. Can you tell me how <clears throat> you your style was when you first started writing as a young man, and then leading up to when you, Judgment of Paris, when you felt that, that you had found your voice? And well, I started so early. Uh, the time I, I wrote Willow War, my first published novel, when I was 19, and I'd already started and abandoned about five books before that. And I was working in the realist American tradition. Hemingway-esque was an adjective used to describe me, at least to describe Willow Up, which was a sea story set in the Second World War in the Bering Sea. But not a war story as much as a sea story. But uh, Hemingway was not the influence on me. It was Stephen Crane who wrote The Open Boat, and it was Crane was very much on my mind uh, when I came to write that book. And I wrote in this plain, fa flat, realistic style, which had come into fashion with Stephen Crane, though he's not given credit for it. Uh, Hemingway saw to it that he got credit for that. But it was really the author of The Red Badge of Courage, not, not the author of Across the River and Into the Trees, God help us. Uh, who has invented the plain style in American literature. It, it comes from Twain, Mark Twain, and it also comes from Stephen Crane. And uh, I didn't dare to be as funny as Mark Twain, probably because I wasn't as funny as Mark Twain. But uh, in other words, Mark Twain is not anyone you can use as a model unless you are a master of wit and humor. If you are, or if you're aiming to be, then Twain is a desirable master. But that's why there's so few imitation Twains. You, you either are that way and can do that kind of comedy, or you can't do it. Where it's much easier to follow the beautiful sentences, straight and clear, of, of Stephen Crane. And if you want to see how good Stephen Crane is, read one of his stories and then read one of Ernest Hemingway's, and you see the difference between a master and a and a journalist sort of hack. And when it came to Judgment in Paris, what happened? Well, the Judgment of Paris was about my fifth or sixth book. 
and the others were getting much freer in form. I was less addicted to the uh, plain style. And remember, I was reading and reading and reading, and I, the more I read, for instance, that was the period that I began to put my roots down, as I mentioned earlier, in uh, Petronius and Apuleius and the classical writers, because they suited me much better than the Victorians or the Edwardians or the American classics, which by and large did nothing for me. And it wasn't, I didn't find literature really exciting, at least the novel, until I had read something like Satirica. And it's interesting when I found that one thing Dawn Powell and I had in common, she too was a child of, of, of Petronius. And you don't find many women, certainly not women of that generation, who would be attracted to anybody so obscene, basically, and uh, graphic and, and wildly funny. And she was all those things. Well, by the time I got to the judgment of Paris, and I got to Paris, and got back to Europe for the first time since I was 13 or 14, before the war, when I first came to this side of the water, and I, um, I just had my voice, and, and I knew exactly the sort of effects I wanted to make, and... Uh, the style just totally changed on me. I wasn't conscious. I was just saying something else. And there was a different metronome ticking in my head. And there was a different, a different music being made. And how much was conscious and unconscious, I would no longer be able to say or guess. It must have been very exciting. Yes, it was. To read something that I quite liked. Always before I kept thinking, well, there's something lacking here. And I get the narrative straight, but where, where, where are the sentences? Where, where is the magic to it? And, of course, I was just doing those plain, flat sentences, which some people are masterful with, as was Stephen Crane. I less so. It, do you find that each book is very different to write? I mean, you've talked about how different it is to write Myra or one of your inventions as, as opposed to one of the historical no novels, for example, but do you find that process tends to be the same, but it's just other sorts of challenges that are different with each book, or, or how much does it vary from book to book? Well, with an invention, it's all a language. When I talk about sentences, that's what I mean. Uh, one sentence leads to another, and you don't know where, they, where anything is going. And that's very exciting to do. And presumably, one hopes it is exciting to read, because you can't guess what's going to happen there. Next, you start to laugh. I started to laugh at not a great joke, but just something, I forget what it was, in Duluth. Um, Cloris Craig, always with quotation marks around her name, because she's, that's, that's her real name, but it's also her pen name. So she has, has to have these, these little marks, brackets, uh, quotation marks. And uh, Cloris Craig was deaf, but then, of course, she was a natural blonde. Well, I find that very funny. I don't know why it's funny, and I don't know where it comes from, but Cloris Craig inspired that in me. And she, only, and she, she can't read or write, really, so she has somebody write her books for her. And she has difficulty with any words over three letters, you know. So she, some people trick her, you know, with four-letter words, knowing that she'll be at, totally at sea. And uh, she th regards them as insincere people. You must have a lot of fun when you're writing a book. I have a lot of fun when I write those books. Of your own books, 
Uh, which are your favorites? No, it's the usual response to that is it's like asking about some, some about children. What I couldn't begin to say. I mean, how, how can I compare creation, which I think is a a necessary book? And I shall be accused of oh, such vanity to think a book is necessary. For those who think it vain, I can only point out you're the same people who think that no book is of any use at all anyway. So, Creation is a book I wish everybody would read. It took me a long time to write it. It's 5th century BC in which all of the religions, ethics, thoughts, sciences uh, evolved. And one man, had he lived to be 70, 75, could have known the Buddha Socrates, Confucius, Mahavira, uh, everybody was contemporary at that time, Zoroaster. I spent years working on that, and it's, it's easy to read. At the end of it, we don't understand Asia. We know nothing about religions other than our own. We don't know much about our own culture. I thought if ever there was a book that if someone else had written it, I would have rushed out and bought it as a kid. And the earlier you read it, probably the better. And it was just taken, oh, just another book. Oh, a historical novel. Well, you know, they're not history and they're not novels. Novels are about marriage and identity, finding your identity. History is just lots of facts, lots of facts, all of them true. Otherwise, they wouldn't be facts, would they? The stupidity, I must say, that a, a writer of my period has had to put up with, and I don't mean myself personally, I mean just the world that I live in, is so devotedly stupid about everything. And the pride with which people take in not knowing anything, if they can help it, is a cause for despair because I can't see much of a civilization other than in the applied sciences which where I am a dummy and others are experts. If, is there any other century you would like to have lived in? No. To have lived through three-fourths of the 20th century I think I have met the greatest bunch of fools that ever lived and I am thrilled to have been in their company. I think you've sort of answered this, but um, why do you enjoy comedic invention so much? Well, obviously I, I have a sense of humor which needs exercise, and comedic humor is one way of doing it, invention. It's, it's also, these books are um, little essays in logic. You, 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 you posit something that everybody takes for granted and then you do a little twist on it and you, it suddenly becomes foreign and strange. Well, partly that's language. Again, that's sentences and again, it's uh, concepts. And... Uh, May I say, you know, the world is not blessed with many comic writers and not very many who can read them. I put off until last year reading Gulliver's Travels because I'd read as a kid the usual thing that you were given as a kid, the Baudelarized version. And rather wearily, I took it down. I said, it's time because I've been compared to Swift so often by school teachers. I thought, well, let's see if there's any resemblance or any similarity. Let's see if he's any good. Well, it's wonderful. I was overwhelmed by it. And concept after concept was just so far more brilliant. Uh, they should burn those Baudelaire books that we were given as kids because they do a disservice that is permanent to a very original comic thinker, satirist, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he, he, he has grasped the world and he's got a firm grip on it. 
I also read a book that I've tried to read for 50 years, and I finally read it, Tristram Shandy. I have never hated anything so much in my life. The word facetious applies to that book. And, and there it was, Abraham Lincoln's, the only novel Lincoln liked was Tristram Shandy. I fear he goes down a notch or two in my uh, inner measurement of great men. Well, he had very um, particular kind of humor himself. Like, well, it was Shaggy Dog, and Tristan Shandy is Shaggy Dog, but there's good Shaggy Dog, and Lincoln was rather good at it part of the time. And then there is just garrulous facetiousness. And uh, I don't mind, I, I love the known sequitur, God knows I go in for that sort of thing myself, but uh, it doesn't work for me. I loved when you said, there's nothing so satisfying as making an audience laugh while removing its insides. <laughs> did I say that? I think you did. <laughs> um, so there's humor and then there's, you know. Eviscerating humor, when the audience is eviscerated and doesn't know it. But you've got to put something back in place of the viscera that you remove. That is the trick. What would you say sets you apart? Sorry. What would you say sets you apart from other American writers? Well, I don't think much about other American writers. Some I like, some I don't care for. Most I'm indifferent to. I never. You see, I read so much. And I don't think many of them, at least the ones I've come to know at all well, read a great deal. They read their contemporaries uh, with an eye to the competition, but uh, you don't find them. Well, uh, one of the reasons I, I sort of uh, escaped literary company most of my life, I've had a few writer friends, but is uh, there wasn't anything to talk about. They didn't read, and I did read. Well, if you can't talk about what you've read, what on earth are you going to talk about? I'm not interested in their marriages or, or their book deals. So I would say that set me apart, and that I was um, probably more interested in literature than most of them. Most of them tend to be, as part of the American temperament, interested in success and all that comes with it. Nothing wrong with that. That was The Greeks were always being accused of overbearing love of glory. But it is, it's rather limiting. So I have never thought of what other writers are writing as being anything similar to what I'm doing. When I do find somebody that I think is doing working in my line of country, like Calvino, then I'm thrilled. I, I, for me, a success by Calvino, I take as personally and delightedly as I do a success by myself. If he succeeds with a book, I feel as if I've succeeded with a book. That is true fandom, and I'm a true fan of certain writers because I feel that what they do is what I do, but they're extending it and they're doing it in ways that I don't do it or I can't do it or haven't done it. And I felt that always with Anthony Burgess, half of whose books don't work, but there's always something very interesting that he's trying to do. And I, I couldn't imagine a Burgess book coming out that I wouldn't go out and buy it and, and read it. And if he succeeds, I'm delighted. If he doesn't, I study it to see now what went wrong with this. What was the idea? 
Those are people that you read with real attention. Somebody who tells a good yarn, I'd just as soon get a video cassette and put it on and have the good yarn unspool itself before my dazzled eye. Which of your fictional characters, if any, do you most identify with? I don't know. Can you sometimes incorporate my question into your answer? So we yeah. Well, one is asked, uh, which of fictional character do you identify with? And um, I don't think I identify with any of them, otherwise they wouldn't be fictional. I'd be autobiographical, I'd be writing palimpsest, I'd be writing a memoir. And I'm not so sure I identify with Gore Vidal either in that book. So what you're doing is searching for new territory, not extending yourself into uh, another frame. Well, let me rephrase it then. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any favorites or... I mean, do you... Forget that. Let me... I, I find when I'm reading your books, I sometimes, you know, I'm making notes and then I... I hear something that Charlie Schuyler says, or Henry Adams says, and, and I feel like I'm hearing you speaking through them. I mean, Charlie Schuyler is probably more someone... Did you use him at all to represent your point of view, if not yourself? Well, I've been asked, uh, you know, do I use characters as spokes? persons for myself, it's possible. Um, let's say I'm against sl slavery at the South, and I have an abolitionist talking in a book called Lincoln, and his views will be my views, but if he's any character at all, he'll speak in his own voice, which won't sound like mine, which is, after all, a, a 20th century voice, and he would be a 19th century voice. In other words, I don't need surrogates for myself. That's why I'm an essayist. If I want to speak ex cathedra, I write an essay, and then, there I am in the first person, and that is my voice. I don't feel any need to impose myself on a fictional character. He's got quite enough to do carrying the fiction, you know. He's got a story to enact. It's like telling an actor, oh, and don't forget the fact that, uh, that I had measles at that time. Is he to get measles in the middle of the performance? <laughs> Just play King Lear, for God's sake, and uh, forget the author's problems. Which book was the most difficult to write? Some have been made difficult by difficult publishers. I had a publisher who made me cut 10,000 words out of creation, which I now plan in a new edition to restore, all because the publisher hated the book, didn't think the American public would like it because it was all about people with funny names like Mahavira and people they didn't know about except as jokes like Confucius, and they just said the American people won't like this. And I said, well, I happen to know what they like, and they, they buy these books of mine, and you just publish it. We had a big fight, and they said, well, the paperback people want 10,000 words out. So I cut 10,000 words, cravenly, which were all part of the beginning of the book, setting up the character of my narrator, who was brought up at the court of the great king of Persia, Xerxes. And it uh, didn't help the book, but the book, to the amazement of the publisher, immediately went on the bestseller list of the New York Times at number two, which happens very rarely, you come on that high in those days. And uh, that was difficult. That wasn't difficult in my writing, it was difficult in my having to deal with a publisher who was a fool. You run into them more and more now, publishing the sort of people who used to go into it, who, because they had a love of literature and a knowledge of it, are now from the Harvard Business School. 
or should be selling units of pasta in Milano rather than being heads of publishing houses. So any difficulties I've had have come from that. I, I read something you said about um, how writing description is very difficult and that writing in the third person is more difficult than writing in the first person. No, I never said that um, writing description was difficult. As a matter of fact, it's rather easy and it has a lot of charm for a certain kind of writer who likes sentences. Uh, in my lifetime as a writer, description have grown smaller and smaller in everyone's novels. And uh, audiences are just, the readers skip over them to get to the dialogue or the sex, and they sort of zigzag their way through books. Uh, so with the passage of time, you tend to describe rather less. Also, you learn how to create a picture without much description. A line or two can uh, suddenly illuminate a whole vista that you could waste five pages on, giving detail after detail. As for what person to write in, first person is easy, but it's, um, it's dangerously easy. It, it's a fallback for the non-expert writer or the uncertain writer. Anybody can write in the first person, particularly if they make it pretty close to their own way of telling a story. And you can leave out a lot of difficult stuff. However, you are limited, obviously, by the voice that you've chosen and by that one character. That's why when I came to Julian, I had four different characters speaking. So you get four, four points of view. The other problem... Uh, is that first person, uh, well, you can't be everywhere. So you're going to have to leave out an awful lot of narrative or you're going to have to come to you as hearsay. Third person is the most difficult because now you're playing God. And what you elect to show is the only thing the reader is ever going to know. Well, that really can tear it, unless you are one of those marathon writers like James Michener, who could just do a million words on Hawaii and tell you more than you ever wanted to know about Hawaii. But he was satisfied with what he was doing, and a certain kind of reader was satisfied with what he was doing. But third person takes more art, and first person takes more talent, even genius, to make it interesting and to make it variable, to make it unexpected. Almost anybody's first person is going to be pretty much like anybody else's first person, so you've got to find new ways of projecting your voice. I knew it was coming to the end. I could hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Are we changing tape? No, changing tape. I'm just flipping uh, the transcript. Is there such a thing as a writer's temperament? And do you have it? Is there such a thing as a writer's temperament? I think that temperaments vary from writer to writer. Some are benign and sunny, and some are dour and misanthropic. I think I'm fairly cheerful. But... Um, I think the true writer is uh, spends a lot of time inside himself, which most people never do, for fear of what they'll find. Uh, I had a biographer of not great talent who was talking to the widow Calvino about me. And she said, and this person writing about me is a very, very simple person and doesn't understand. He's not used to the conversation of intellectuals. He's never known any. 
She's an academic. And she made an interesting remark. She told me about it later, and then, then I was told what he had written about it. She said, look, with Gore Vidal, you are not looking at somebody who has a secret raging life, who's filled with neurosis and all sorts of demons. He uses everything, and that is what a certain kind of writer uses everything, like Calvino, like Vidal. Don't go looking for what isn't going to be there, because he uses everything in his work. He does not have a raging unconscious. Whatever is there is used up in the work. This poor fool came up. Gore Vidal has no unconscious, says Mrs. Calvino. Imagine, the author of Myra Breckenridge has no unconscious mind. I mean, when you're up against, that to me is really the basic stupidity of so much of the academic world. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't tell them things because they can't conceive of it. They have about five cliches they work on. And, oh, well, you see, he had a cold mother or he had a, an absent father or he, has, uh, he was enraged because his SAT scores were so low. This guy was actually interested in my school grades. And I said, what are you interested in that for? Well, he said, that's very important. Well, I said, that's very important to you so that you didn't have to end up driving a taxi cab, which is what nature intended you for. Uh, you had to rise in the academic world, and you had to get good marks in school. I was going to go to Harvard as long as I could just pass my courses in prep school. So I never got above a C. And I said, and I said that took some effort because I was bored to death. I wanted to know so many more things that I was going to be taught in these schools. And these were allegedly the best schools. I might just as well have been saying the Pelagian heresy will never take place in Afghanistan. I mean, what I was saying was just so wild to him. So there's a whole section that now occupies the English departments, the history departments, the liberal, the humanities, in every university of people who think in terms of grades. God knows they don't think in terms of subjects because they don't know any. How does it feel when you finish a book? Do you, are you relieved or do you miss writing that book? Do you miss those characters? In my youth, when I finished a book, We'll say, I finished, I can remember, I finished, um, well, I forget which one it was, but I finished a book on a Sunday, and on a Monday, I took the train to New Orleans, and on the train, I started to write Dark Green, Bright Red about Guatemala, longhand, on a yellow pad, legal pad. Because I was going back to Guatemala, and I had a house there then, and uh, I already had a novel in mind. So the second I finished one book, I go straight on to another one. Mind you, I, I, I lived on advances in those days, but uh, at the same time I would have written it even if I hadn't been poor. I guess what I mean is, when you're, you're writing Julian or writing um, creation, you're living in a certain century and you're steeped in it. You're thinking in those terms. You're finding voices that would be appropriate, and you get to know your characters so well. And do you miss them when you finish? No. You've got to rewrite. Then you have proofs. You have galleys. It goes on forever. You're relieved when you're done with them. Let's talk about essays a little bit, not in particular at the moment yet, but um, we could. Um, why do you write essays? Well, it's, I want to speak in my own voice and not in the voice of an invention or of a historical figure. 
uh, and I'm not about to cheat and make my invention into another version of myself, because I have the essay for that, and I'm certainly not going to have Abraham Lincoln start sounding like me, which indeed he did not, and uh, it would be inappropriate, my favorite 20th century word, which is now leaking into the 21st century. Uh, the essay is, is, I think, the only necessary form of prose, but really necessary. And as we begin to lose the novel, it's gradually expiring. Poetry is healthy, but it's minor, and it will probably be replaced by popular music of some sort. But po poetry, I, I can see having a long long time ahead, ahead of it. The novel, I don't see. Narratives that people want to see, they, they will always want narratives, but they will get them through film, digital or otherwise. The essay is the moment in which it comes from the friends, essay A, to try, to try. It's an attempt. It's an attempt to get through to another person. I want to tell you something that I have discovered about the Twelve Caesars that it was their normality to be bisexual, and that any male in that situation in which he is the lord of the earth will do both. And that is loud and clear from Suetonius on to anybody who's ever thought about it. This for 1950 was heresy, it was a novelty. There'll be people listening to me right now who will say, oh, this is not true, it's not true. Well, of course it's true. And I am saying, and I, I make my case, and that's what the essay is. I attempt a case that what I have discovered on rereading Suetonius in a new translation uh, brought me the obvious insight, so obvious that nobody's noticed it. Occam's razor can be used to cut many a throat. And is the process for writing, do you want water? Mm -mm. Is the process for writing essays, is that a different writing process for you than writing fiction? Mm, yes, it is different. It's, it's sentences again, but they're coming from you, and you really are in your own voice. And uh, I like to circle the subject before I get my knife out. So I do a lot of circling and uh, setting up and false leads. And uh, I, pl I play with the reader. And then I, I start to move in. And my image, as I start to really hit my subject, I have a sort of inner image that is as though I'm between two gongs and I've got a and I hit one, and then I go back and back, and there's a rhythm that begins as you make your case. And it should be just, it should be inexorable. I told Kenneth Tynan, the critic, that once. He said, well, yours may be hitting a pair of gongs. My image as a critic is I'm up there with a sword in hand losing a battle. <laughs> I said, no, you're in a duel with yourself.